We know that this year has been an extraordinary year and many of us found ourselves with more time on our hands than usual uh, because of the restrictions. So if you do have some time, uh, some free time and wondering how you could prepare yourself uh, for your degree, I will have a few tips and suggestions for you to explore over the summer. I actually had a chance to chat with some of you um, individually over the last few weeks and I compiled a frequently asked questions list based on our discussions, uh, which are particularly about how to prepare um, for your degree. OK, so let's start with the first one. Do you have any suggestions for books to read or films to watch before I start my degree? Um, yes, here on this link, uh, you will find a recommended reading and moving list for film study students at Leicester. This is an introductory sample list compiled by the film study staff at Leicester. We think these are the best places to start with in order to familiarize yourselves with the content that you might encounter during your studies. If you haven't already had a chance to look at this list, please do visit this link. What do I look for when I'm watching the films from the suggested viewing list? Should I be looking at a particular in a particular way? I think this is a great question. Of, quite a few of you asked me this question um, in, in the past few weeks. And yes, it is true that watching a film from the perspective of a film study student means watching it critically. What do I mean by this? Um, films communicate feelings or meanings. They do not just affect us with their narrative, uh, with their plot, but also with their aesthetic, of course, with the way in which they look and sound and the way in which they're structured. This is how films make sense to us or how they move us uh, emotionally. To understand why films move us or how they make sense to us, how they communicate a feeling, we need to be able to read them. Not only read what we see, but also we need to know the particular historical, social and technological contexts that they were produced in. So let's have a look at an example, a quick, simple example from your suggested viewing list. You can always start by picking a frame or a shot, just a small segment of a film, uh, of the film that you're watching and ask yourselves, what do I see and how do I make sense of it? How was this created? to make this kind of sense to me. So here you see uh, uh, an iconic film still, meaning a still uh, image from the film Breathless by um, the French director Jean-Luc Godard from 1960. Some of you might have seen this film or heard of it. It is a classic French new wave film, a movement associated with youthfulness, carelessness, the post-war spirit of recovery, uh, rejuvenation and prosperity in Europe. This is perhaps one of the most iconic images from film history. What does this image convey to us? What kind of a feeling does it communicate? Even this one frame, one still image can say a lot to us about the film beyond just what we immediately notice. Uh, here we see a man and a woman, uh, Michelle and Patricia. Michelle is a French uh, petty criminal and Patricia is an American journalism student selling New York Herald Tribune on a Parisian boulevard. And this is an urban outdoor setting, a bustling city, which means it's not filmed in the studio, a kind of dynamic image with much less control over what the camera c captures. So we can start interpreting the costumes, right? and infer that Michelle looks a lot like those characters in American gangster films, a lot like Hollywood detectives, for example, or famous stars like Humphrey Bogart, who you see in this image. Um, the suit, the hat, the cigarette, the swagger, all of this tells us that this image is referential to Hollywood cinema. But OK, so look at Patricia, on the other hand, played by Jean Seberg, She's not quite like those glamorous classical Hollywood stars like Grace Kelly or Marilyn Monroe, you know, who exude a more, a much more glamorized uh, femininity. 
Jean Seberg is remarkable here in the way she is styled. Of course, she's stylish without star glamour. Uh, she has an unusual haircut for the audiences in 1960 who were not used to seeing short hair on, on women film stars. So here we already are noticing how this film both functions in relation to a history of cinema, a history of images, in the way in which the characters are positioned with each other, how they're dressed, uh, how they're styled. Yet it also disrupts this history with difference, which clearly is demanding the audiences to see and notice its difference. So, I mean, this was just a very basic analysis of one iconic image. Uh, we have seen that seemingly unremarkable components of the image, such as costume, hair and makeup, can tell us much more than just what we take for granted. Reading a film requires understanding how these different components of the images work holistically. When you watch the rest of the film, by the way, uh, you'll find out that Michelle and Patricia are unusual characters. They are difficult to identify with. Uh, we see how they move, act, uh, how they talk, their gestures, the way in which they speak, which is quite often unintelligible even. Uh, but all of these reveal very little to us about their psychology or their motivations. So here, Breathless is a film about the look, this cool new, I mean, cool new uh, urban image rather than psychology, character interiority or motivation or plot. This new youth was unfamiliar to audiences at the time who were familiar with characters driven by psychology or a goal, uh, you know, which were found most frequently on the classical cinema of the 40s and 50s. So this new look, this new youthful look, brought a whole new experience and energy to cinema. Let's remember again that this film was made in 1960 at a time when Europe had recovered from the aftermath of one of its greatest tragedies, the Second World War. This Europe needed a new spirit that broke free from the past traditions, a dynamic image and performances which disrupted familiarity and identification. So then, different components of film language, to summarize, uh, different components of film language help our understanding of film, but they're by no means uh, exhaustive or work in isolation. While watching these films, you can note down what you notice in the image, what is exposed, what is, uh, you know, the details which may seem unremarkable on their own, but it can in fact reveal a lot when you see them in connection to other elements or techniques. You will learn a lot about the key components of film language and how they work in relation to one another, but you can always start by paying close attention to a segment of a film and ask yourself, how has this particular light, performances, costumes, objects, and the order of the shots work together to achieve a particular effect?